It's fascinating to think that almost every one of the trillions of cells in your body contains your entire genome, the genetic instructions for making an entire person. But in order to make a person out of that massive information, your body needs to be able to tightly control how it expresses the roughly 20,000 protein coding genes it contain, that genome contains. What proteins does it make when and where? All organisms are faced with a similar central dilemma. Their cells have the genetic instructions for making every protein that any of their cells could ever need. But different cells will want different amounts of different proteins at different times. Oh, and it would be great if they could respond rapidly to environmental cues as well. The stakes are high. Keeping tight control over protein levels is crucial for allowing for development and enabling proper cellular functioning. And if protein levels get dysregulated, diseases such as cancer can occur. Therefore, organisms have evolved multiple mechanisms to tightly regulate the levels of protein. The central dogma of molecular biology is that a DNA gene gets transcribed into messenger RNA copies that get translated into protein. Often these regulatory mechanisms center around controlling the levels of the messenger RNAs. Transcriptional control is great for large-scale changes, like turning genes quote-unquote on and off. But it can take time to go into effect and doesn't deal with pre-existing messenger RNAs. Post-transcriptional regulation, on the other hand, is well suited to serve a buffering role, fine-tuning the amounts of proteins and acting rapidly. A main evolutionarily conserved mechanism of post-transcriptional regulation is RNA interference, or RNAi. RNAi is a mechanism that specifically downregulates messenger RNAs in a sequence-specific manner. At its heart is the protein I study, argonaut, or ego. Ego is a powerful protein, but it can't act alone. Instead, it gets programmed by binding to small RNAs, which can be microRNA or siRNA, to form a core RNA-induced silencing complex, or RISC. These small RNAs are around 22 nucleotides long, and at their 5' end, they contain a 6 to 8 nucleotide long seed sequence that enables Ego to use them as guides to find and bind messenger RNA targets that contain complementarity to the seed and variable amounts of downstream complementarity. Upon binding to these targets, which are typically located in the messenger RNA 3' UTR, Ego is able to, alone or with the help of cofactors, induce translational repression and or mRNA degradation, decreasing the production of the corresponding protein. The majority of your genes are regulated in part through microRNA, and many messenger RNAs contain binding sites from multiple microRNAs, allowing for combinatorial regulation. In addition to this crucial natural role, the programmable nature of RNAi makes it a powerful therapeutic and experimental tool for quote-unquote knocking down genes. The core risk complex, Ego plus Gai, is incredibly stable with a half-life of weeks. This gives a single risk a lot of power, as long as it's able to efficiently release a target, it is able to target multiple messenger RNAs over its lifetime, all corresponding to the targets that have complementarity to that microRNA or siRNA seed. So where do these small RNAs come from? MicroRNA is transcribed as a long precursor transcript called primary microRNA, that gets cleaved by a microprocessor complex through a shorter but still long hairpin called pre-microRNA. This gets exported into the cytoplasm where it meets a protein called dicer. This is also where exogenous double-stranded RNA comes in to act as the precursors for siRNA. Plants and invertebrates use um, double-stranded RNA from viral um, RNA as precursors for making antiviral RNAi, but our bodies have evolved more complex immune systems and don't use antiviral um, RNAi to any large extent. Upon binding to dicer, these substrates can then be processed and cleaved into a roughly 22 nucleotide long duplex that gets loaded into argonaut to form the pre-risk. Argonaut then releases the passenger strand to um, exposing the seed region of the guide 
to find um, messenger RNA targets that match. Upon binding to such a target, what happens next depends in part on the argonaut and in part on the amount of complementarity between this guide and the target. Some argonaut proteins, such as the main human argonaut, IGO2, have slicing ability. Therefore, if they bind to a perfectly complementary target, such as typical with siRNAs, IGO can um, cleave the target across some nucleotides, nucleotides 10 and 11 in a process referred to as slicing, exposing the ends for exonuclease chewing, leading to mRNA degradation. With partially complementary targets, as is typical of animal microRNAs, IGO um, can't slice the target and instead it recruits cofactors. It binds to a scaffolding protein of the GW182 family and recruits deadenylation and decapping um, complexes to expose the ends of the um, messenger RNA for decay. It can also interact with factors to inhibit translation and can sequester uh, messenger RNAs. Once it releases the target, it is then free to do this again, so an ego can target multiple um, messenger RNAs over its lifetime. At the heart of all of these diverse processes is ego. Ego has four main domains, N, PAS, MID, and PeeWee, as well as two linker regions, L1 and L2. The small RNA, so the microRNA or the siRNA, in this case MIR20, winds its way through Argonaut with the 5' prime end held tight in a pocket created by the mid and peewee domains, and the 3' prime end held in the PAS domain. You can think of Ego as looking a bit like a duck. In that analogy, the head of the duck is the PAS domain biting down on the RNA. The middle region of the RNA is disordered in the crystal structure, so it's unresolved, and therefore I'm just showing it as a dashed line, but the RNA all really is there.